When it comes to flat earth personalities, there is one who seems to have wormed his way into the public eye more than any other. Can I ask yeah, Mark, do you yeah. believe that um, men have been on the moon, Mark? No, no, oh, do not believe right. anything the Americans tell you about their space program <laughs> at all. Wow. Right, but you're an American, are you or not? I absolutely am an American. Why should I believe you as an American, but not any other American? <laughs> Yes, that was flat earther Mark Sargent, who has not only found himself on countless TV and radio interviews, but he was also one of the main subjects of the recent flat earth documentary, Behind the Curve. But how did Mark become so infamous in the flat earth community? Where did it all start? Today, we find out. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Flat Earth Friday. If you are new here, I am your host and my name is Simon Dan. Yes, today we're looking at the first video in a series of videos that Mark Sargent calls Flat Earth Clues. The videos are often cited as a Flat Earther's first look at Flat Earth and potentially converted hundreds at the very beginning. That and I've seen dedicated trolls on the Flat Earth Society website who show up every day and say the same thing to new forum members. It's a joke. It's not serious. Nothing to see here. So let's start from the beginning and look at the very first video in the Flat Earth Clues series. Perhaps if I make my own series critiquing his, we can stop more from trickling over to the other side. Away we go. This is a Reader's Digest version containing many of the interesting parts of the Flat Earth theory. For those who have already started seeing things with new eyes, it will be mostly a recap, but there could be a few new angles you haven't looked at. For the rest of you who are new to this, the first question is invariably, is this a joke? Because it's a joke, right? Unfortunately not, it seems. Yes, there are grown adults who walk around believing that the Earth is flat. Grown adults who have no problem whatsoever in completely disregarding all of the scientific discoveries of history. What Mark doesn't seem to realise, though, is the joke is well and truly on them. And that's where we start, because it's one of our two basic childhood facts. One plus one equals two, and the Earth is a globe. Actually, in the UK anyway, they don't look at Earth and space until year five, which is about nine and ten years old. They do look at the seasons in year one, five to six years old, but other than that, they don't have any other sort of teachings. Obviously, there could be a globe in the classroom, and obviously it could be referred to from time to time, but it's not officially taught. We're taught this before almost everything else, and that right there should give you a clue on how serious this secret is. Well, not really. I don't think it's unreasonable to tell a child what our home looks like. But for those who have forgotten their history, Here's the modified Men in Black version. For the first 4,000 years of our civilization, we believe that the Earth was a flattish disk surrounded by a solid dome barrier called the firmament. Yeah, that was pretty embarrassing, wasn't it? Let's move on from that quickly. All of the five major religions had their own version of this, and the churches enforced the belief. Then, around 1514, a man named Copernicus created a new model of the world, he stated that if the Earth was spinning around 1,100 miles an hour and circling the Sun at 60,000 miles an hour, the world was then round. This is absolutely not how it happened. Copernicus already knew that the Earth was spherical. He just changed the geocentric view that we all had. For a full rundown on the history of astronomy, I thoroughly recommend you check out my series of lectures. I'll leave the link for those in the description. And while the math more or less worked, there was a problem. It was 1500, and the technology to prove such a theory wasn't there. The first balloon to carry people wasn't invented until 1760. Sailboats were the only travel over water, and the fastest thing on land was a horse. But the new worldview was promoted and took hold. The religions adapted to handle the new reality, and life moved on. Yes, because it was correct. This is how science works. Our level of understanding increases as time moves on. Explanations and theories are superseded by other explanations and theories until we get it 
Bang on. More importantly, the globe model was quickly introduced into the education systems. And why wouldn't it? Over the next 500 years, the challenges to this model faded, to the point where the globe was accepted as universally as physical laws such as gravity. Read that again if you didn't absorb it. For 20 generations, people believed that the Earth was round because there was a globe in every classroom they sat in. Well, no. They learned about the fact that the Earth is round and they had the level of understanding that's required in order to accept something as a universal truth. Also, YouTube wasn't around back then, which helped tremendously. There was no proof. Hundreds of years went by, and still, civilization had no way of proving the theory. Planes were invented around 1900, but until 1957, nothing could go high enough to give a true perspective of where we lived. And that's when everything got strange. The United States and Russia both sent up rockets high enough to take decent pictures, and what they saw scared them a great deal. How do we know they were extremely concerned about the sky? Because the US and Russia immediately started firing nuclear weapons straight up, and they kept firing for the next four years. So how do you go from two countries testing nuclear weapons by firing them high up into the sky to the Earth's flat? Seems preposterous to me. A few things to keep in mind here. First, this was now 1958. Nuclear weapons were very expensive and hard to come by. These also weren't those nominal yield 20 kiloton toys we used on Hiroshima. This was high kiloton to low megaton, and we couldn't get them up fast enough. And the strangeness continued in other places. In 1959, only a year into the atmosphere bombardment, ten nations, including the United States, made Antarctica off-limits to any colonization. A treaty was put in place, and to this day remains intact. Over 50 nations now have signed off on this treaty. Do you know any treaty that has lasted that long between all industrialized nations? Moreover, do you know any piece of real estate in the world that is owned by no one? You would think at the very least one of the large oil companies would use their huge financial resources to explore this region, and yet they don't even petition the idea. So that's got nothing to do with the minus 60 degree temperature then, or the fact that Antarctica is on a giant slab of continent rather than an ocean. And of course the inhospitable environment means that everyone wants to go there. The treaty states that Antarctica shall continue forever to be used exclusively for peaceful purposes and shall not become the scene for object or international discord. Why would you want to rock that boat with 54 countries on board? The short version of the discovery is this. By 1958, the military had discovered the very solid upper and outer edges of our world and had to create a way to put up do not enter signs without looking obvious. It was tricky, but if there is one thing I have learned about the authority, it's that nothing is left to chance. Most of the work had already been done for them, so their job was primarily in the details. The sky part of the dome was much higher than commercial air traffic, so the only thing they had to worry about there was the space program, which is immediately militarized. Whilst there has been crossover missions between NASA and the military, NASA itself is a civilian agency. The outer border had the natural benefit of not only an extensive ocean, but a scaling decrease in temperature and a steady increase in iceberg frequency to discourage ships, all leading to a permanently frozen landmass that could not be used for any form of agriculture. This ocean and ice layout had worked well for thousands of years because the technology of the current civilization didn't evolve quickly. Sailors avoided cold weather seas whenever possible, and oxygen levels get low enough to harm people, even on high mountains. Yes, we've discussed this. It's a difficult place to go, so why go there all the time? The brilliance of the design comes in the simple fact that human males are corrupted by power. Corruption so total, in fact, that they would rather hide the world itself rather than risk their power on it. Please tell me how power on a globe Earth and power on a flat Earth are different. If you're in power, you're in power, regardless of the shape of a planet. Ridiculous statement. You could theorize that kings and popes were told of the world a long time ago. Maybe an ancient scroll or book. 
Perhaps an interdimensional being told the tale of what the world looked like. But this was all but dismissed, because even the most powerful leaders of the day couldn't reach the borders. And if they couldn't, what chance did the de general public have? It's one thing to be told of the giant impenetrable dome, but it's a whole different animal when you finally stand right next to it. And please let me know, Mark, how you're doing with finding that edge. What's that? You haven't found it yet? Must be those armed penguins of the Antarctic. Then the tough decisions have to be made. Do we keep the secret? And how far are we willing to go to keep the status quo? Once they decided to keep the secret, no expense was spared. The rapid progression of rocketry science had to be addressed quickly, and so the moon missions were created. Matt from the NASA channel was right in his thinking that you needed the moon mission event to stage a picture of the Earth from deep orbit. And that couldn't be more true. Establishing NASA as the frontrunner of space exploration also diverted people who would have otherwise created their own space companies for profit. The best engineers, technicians, and pilots were recruited to the NASA space program. Once there, they were compartmentalized on a need-to-know basis. The astronauts know of the deception and are sworn to secrecy under the penalty of whatever motivates them. Okay, this is full-on Tim Full Hat. A load of unsubstantiated theories about an organization that has a waste paper basket in its corridor that has a higher natural intelligence than an average flat earther. Private space programs are discouraged, sabotaged, or absorbed into the NASA fold. Private sector spacecraft are just not going to be allowed for several reasons. The most obvious is the collision with the dome itself. I can't seem to see a dome here. The telemetry data from such a mission would show an impact failure at a certain altitude, and if repeated, would raise questions NASA just isn't prepared to answer. There are three perpetual questions about our world that can't be eliminated, but avoided at all costs. These are the questions you should ask yourself and others if this protective layer is going to be lifted. I'd like to preface this with a thank you to Max Malone, a conspiracy hardcore who has a knack for boiling down debates to a single paragraph whenever possible. It was he who said, after over 50 years and thousands of hours of space travel footage, both by NASA and other countries, there is no exterior shot where the astronaut completes the simple act of panning the camera 180 degrees, let alone a full 360 degree sweep. This has never happened on any moon mission, exterior space station, nothing, ever. So, they aren't out there to appease flat earthers and conspiracy theorists. They're out there to do a job, risking their lives for humanity every single day. Statistics will tell you that this would have already happened by accident years ago. But it hasn't. And it won't. This is because of the rule they cannot break. The same rule that applies to television set shows that never show the fourth wall. Why? Because there is no fourth wall. Number two. When you search online for pictures of the Earth from space, 95% of what you will see is a collection of artificial composite shots. In 2000, when I did this search, there was exactly one picture by NASA showing the bottom part of Africa and Antarctica. Now that picture is hidden within hundreds of simulated images. There are HD cameras everywhere and no one is taking a shot of the Earth because you can't get enough altitude to do it.
Number three, the commercial air travel routes for the Southern Hemisphere are wrong. This is an easy thing you can check out in 60 seconds. Take a map reading of the distance between anywhere near Australia and anywhere in South America. It's a straight shot across the South Pacific. Now find your favorite travel site and try to get there non-stop. See what happens. No problem. Here we go. Santiago, Chile to Sydney, Australia, non-stop. Easy. The routes start turning ridiculous. I used to business travel for years, and I've never seen anything like it. It's the one thing in the general public world they can't hide. The actual distance between these two places. On a round world, the flight is easy. Just a straight shot across an ocean. But on a flat world, it becomes the greatest distance between two points. There are no shortcuts. So they distract you with multiple connections and layovers. Except for the flight that I found in like, what, 15 seconds? And I bet I could find more as well. It's only blind luck that the United States was in the Northern Hemisphere, otherwise the increased traffic would have raised eyebrows by now. I know, I know. It's madness. It's lunacy. There are people who will tell you straight to your face that all the leaders of the world are lizards, and yet these people laugh out loud when you say the words Flat Earth. That's because it's funny, Mark. I was, and still am, a huge conspiracy guy. I literally ran out of new tin hat topics to research, and I still wouldn't look at this one without embarrassment. But every time I glanced at it, there was something unresolved. And once I saw the near perfection of the whole plan, I was hooked. Do your own homework. Ask the questions. Get past the possibility and see if you can move into an even bigger picture. Like who built the dome and why? I think you'll be waiting a long time for the answer to that one, buddy. That's where it starts to get really interesting and things start opening up. I know I said years ago that the greater good was something that should be preserved. That JFK, Pearl Harbor, and 9-11 were inevitable. I still believe it, and I understand the decisions. The globe illusion, however, has run its course over the last 500 years. It's time to start again. If that means we end up getting the attention of who or what created this place, and force the reset of the world, is that such a bad thing? Yeah, it's awful. I've only just got my play button for one thing. Mark dribbles on a bit more about links that aren't important and rounds it off after that. Overall, it's a thoroughly tragic attempt at trying to show there is some big secret that's being kept from all of us. If you found this video looking for Mark Sargent's Flat Earth Clues, then you've had a lucky escape. Remember, this is a man who thinks a Flat Earth documentary that he starred in that debunked Flat Earth multiple times is good. That tells you all you need to know about Mr. Sargent. Right, that about wraps up another Flat Earth Friday. I had huge amounts of fun with this one. I hope you enjoyed it too. Please, please do like and subscribe if you did. I have been Simon Dan. Have a great weekend and I'll see you all on Sunday night for the third live astronomy lecture. See you all then.